camera design. Now the good news here is that this isn't 2022 anymore and while the camera accessory market doesn't move instantaneously, there has been a lot of movement since the R5C came to market. And this is especially true for USB power delivery based power solutions. What's up everybody, I'm Jason and welcome back to some more tips and tricks for the Canon EOS R5C. So with almost two years of using the camera under my belt and of course new products coming to market, I thought, you know, it might be a good time to revisit my R5C rig and power solutions and talk about what has and hasn't worked and what has changed. Now, while the R5C is in no way the only reason that USB power delivery solutions have progressed in the camera industry, I think it has at least been a big part or a big factor in the proliferation of higher powered USB PD systems, namely because it requires 30 watts. And before that, it was very hard to find something that would support that. Since the R5C's release, we have seen way more in the way of smart V-mount style batteries with USB PD support, as well as smaller batteries and smaller, specifically camera specific battery solutions. And oh yes, I should note, this video may end up sounding a bit like a small rig advertisement. And before I go any further, I have received nothing from them, either financially or in free products. In fact, I'm not even sure I've ever received an email from them or sent an email to them. Everything I'm going to talk about in this video, whether it's small rig or any other brand, I bought. Now, that said, I kinda do keep going back to small rig for a lot of things for a number of reasons. First, of course, is price. Their stuff really isn't that expensive. And as a YouTube scale shooter, I don't have a thousand dollars to spend on a Mac box and another thousand dollars to spend on a follow focus. So they can't be that expensive. Second is quality. While their gear is not overly expensive with few exceptions, I can only think of one really, it's been made well enough to hold up to my kind of use. Now, does this mean you could take it to Antarctica and slam it around in a major Hollywood production? Maybe not, but you know, if you're a YouTuber, it probably will work just fine. Finally, more often than not, they actually have something that solves a specific problem I have. And that means I don't have to cobble together 10 different bits of parts or modify something that is some, you know, not specific to the purpose to do what I need. So, that said, I will link all of the stuff that I talk about in the description if you're interested in picking it up. Now, with that said, let's talk about rigging and powering the R5C as the market exists today in the first quarter of 2024. And I think the best place to start this whole discussion is at the core with the camera cage. Now, while a simple L plate or even just a base quick release plate is entirely sufficient for still photography, there is just way too much stuff that you need to mount on your cinema camera or your video camera for that to work well in video applications. To solve that problem, many of us use a camera cage that's designed to augment the mount limited mounting options that exist on the camera with a lot more places to mount things. Now for that, I chose to go with Small Rig's 3234B, or what they title as the R5 slash R5C slash R6 black mamba cage. And specifically, I got the kit that comes with a top handle because I needed or wanted a top handle with it, but either way, it works. This is also the full cage, not the half cage as well. Now at the time I got it, I still fancied myself as a photographer with no, only a side aspect in video. I wasn't going to be shooting video everything. And as such, I didn't want the crossbar that's found on most of these cages that goes over the LCD and the top buttons and therefore interferes with the viewing of that screen and the top buttons and so on and so forth. And I wanted something that would be low profile on the grip side or even augment the grip. And the our Black Mamba fit the bill on that. However, over the last two years, I've done vastly more video than I have shot stills. Um, so much so that I miss shooting stills. Now that said, even with that shift in usage, the Black Mamba cage hasn't held me back. In fact, the one complaint that I have with the cage, which is that the cold shoe on the left side would 
not the most useful thing for me, I'd like something more secure, would actually only be marginally addressed by switching out to a different cage. Almost all of the ones out there have a cold shoe in the same place. And quite honestly, I could also address it with a number seven drill and a quarter 20 tap and move on with my life. Now, additionally, I have found that even though I frequently do use a single 15 millimeter rod for my follow focus, I am absolutely thrilled that I didn't upgrade or buy the upgraded R5C version of that cage. So the difference is the R5C upgraded version has a 15 millimeter rod socket that's on the front of the cage. And that socket or threaded insert, or threaded, whatever you want to call it, blocks access to the remote release terminal, which when I started this, I was thinking about from photography applications, but it turns out that I actually use this all the time coupled with radio triggers to start and stop videos when I'm shooting something like this. So by and large, that cage has been a win and it would certainly be something that I would recommend. And of course, if you know you have no interest in not doing anything but hardcore video stuff, then the higher end, or I won't say higher end, the less streamlined cages, which have more rigidity, might be a better choice for you. Now, moving slightly away from the cage, something I also find invaluable since I got it, is a follow focus. And if you do video, especially if you do manual focusing, you really need one. In fact, I find it hard to argue against having or using one, period. Basically what it's going to do for you is it shifts the way you manipulate the camera's focus in such a way that you like don't have to think as much basically. So normally if you're focusing with the focus ring on the lens, you have a ring rotation that's orthogonal, if you will, to the lens axis and the way that focus is moving. And when you use a follow focus, it rotates that onto a knob where the industry standard convention is that the focus plane or the part of the image or where the focus is in perfect focus moves in the direction that the bottom of the knob moves. So if you're move, pushing it so that the knob's rotating away from you or the bottom of the knob's rotating away from you, your focus is moving away from you. Now for a follow focus, I chose another small rig product here, the 3010C mini follow focus F40, or more specifically, its immediate predecessor, but looking at the two, they look almost the same. Now, again, cost was a big factor for me, but I also wanted something that had some of the features that the more expensive options had. Specifically, I wanted adjustable hard stops that you could selectively enable and disable, and this follow focus has it. Now, for a sub $100 follow focus, which is incredibly cheap if you look at some of the higher end stuff out there, I consider the build quality to be entirely satisfactory. I'm I haven't had a problem with it and it's mostly metal. Now that said, I am kind of itching to upgrade to a wireless follow focus system for a number of reasons, some of which I will touch on later. Uh, I've been looking at something like Tilta's Nucleus Nano 2 system, but quite honestly, I don't think that's a good use of my money at the kind of with the kind of shooting that I do. But given the price, you might want to look at those if you don't have a follow focus on the theory that they're not that much more expensive, a couple hundred dollars instead of a hundred dollars, and you get a lot more flexibility out of it. Now, the other part of the follow focus equation is of course the lens focus rings. Now, of course, if you are shooting with cinema lenses, those focus gears are already built into your lenses. However, if like me, you shoot with still lenses, then you're gonna need some kind of mod 0.8 gear to put on them. And for that, I actually use Tilta's seamless focus gear rings. Now, Small Rig does make some options that are similar as well. I just happen to go with Tilta's first. Now that said, one of my complaint, biggest complaints with these rings, and it goes for both small rig and Tilta, is that they don't make them in big enough diameters for some of my lenses. Specifically, my 28 to 70 f2 and my 100 to 500 are just too big around for the focus rings. Now, I have worked around this by splicing together multiple smaller rings to get one that's larger than the largest diameter that they make, 
And if you're interested in doing something like that, I will link my video on this process so that you can go check that out. And speaking of follow focuses, most, including the wireless ones, mount on standard 15 millimeter rails. However, I also have a DJI RS3 Pro gimbal and DJI's focus motors use a smaller 12 millimeter rod, which I don't quite understand because it's not that much smaller or lighter. In any event, I find this somewhat amusing because of that, but let's just get to the point here. DJI, of course, includes all of the mounting hardware that you need to attach their rod to their base plates to put on their gimbal so that you can focus manual focus lenses and all of that through it. Personally, I find that whole solution to be a bit fiddly. Which brings me to small rigs, 120 millimeter long, 15 to 12 millimeter adapter rod. This lets me use the same 15 millimeter rod mount that's already attached to my cage for my follow focus instead of having, no, I just have to take the follow focus off. In fact, it's a quick release mount so I can take the whole rod off that, you know, fairly easily. But all I have to do is instead of fiddling around with DJI's hardware and rod and all of that, I can just put this adapter rod on, put their focus motor on and rock and roll as they say. Anyway, I recently added another bit of kit to my setup and that was a mat box. Uh, for this, I sprung for another small rig option and that was their 114 millimeter diameter multifunction modular mat box kit, if you will. Now they also make a 95 millimeter version and that does save you some cash and some size and weight. However, I wanted to be able to use mine with my RF 28 to 70 F2L USM lens and that has an overall outside diameter of over just under 105 millimeters and well, 105 that's bigger than 95 and that makes that a problem. Moreover, 114 millimeters is a standard diameter for a lot of cinema lenses. Maybe not the big zooms, but a lot of them. And of course, it is easy to adapt that 114 millimeter mount diameter down to something smaller, but as always, going the other way around is a lot more problematic. Now that said, I am not convinced how important a matte box is for the vast majority of us, if, especially if you're not shooting outside in significant conditions where you need neutral density and then you need to have shading for the neutral density to prevent glare and all of that kind of stuff. So to start with, if you are using still lenses, almost all of them come with lens hoods. So the hood aspect of the matte box isn't necessarily going to be that big of a factor. Now, the real boon of a matte box, as I said, is the ability to hold neutral density and effect filters and then still provide shading so that they don't cause glare. And this is where things get both more complicated and more expensive. So a full set of straight neutral density filters on the cheap end of things is probably going to run you around $800 or so. At least that's the case if you look at small rigs options. And from higher end manufacturers, someone like say Tiffin, well, then you're looking at something like $300 or more per filter. So a lot of money. And of course, yes, there are variable neutral density filters for these kinds of matte boxes or for matte boxes. Unfortunately, it seems like nobody uses any kind of standard for this. So Small Rig makes one, Polar Pro makes one, uh, but they only seem to work in each brand specific matte box. So if you have a favorite filter manufacturer, like I do, then you're kind of stuck in what your options are. Now, that said, the question of need, as far as I can tell, comes down to a combination of what you do, how you work, and what you already have for gear. So if you already have variable neutral density filters, and you're shooting with still lenses, and you don't want to look like you're working in a Hollywood production, maybe not a matte box. In my situation, that's kind of where I'm at. I don't think the matte box was the best purchase for me. Um, just because, but hey, you know, that said, it sure looks good on the camera. Next, I want to talk a little bit about handles or grips. And this is something that I haven't done anything on, but probably should. Now, aside from the top handle that came with my cage, I don't have any other grips or handles and I haven't bought any yet either. 
That said, side handles are absolutely useful tools in stabilizing handheld footage. Now, of course, this is part of the reason I don't have any. 99% of the time I'm shooting from a tripod, so putting grips and handles on my camera, other than the top one to make it easier to carry, is not super useful. However, I have been looking at some options, and this is also part of why I have been looking at those wireless or remote focusing motors. Specifically, if your hands aren't on the lens, it's really kind of hard to focus it or zoom it. And if you're on a handle, well, meh, yeah, how does that work? Well, the answer to that is the electronic or, sla or wireless focusing motors, again, like Tilta's Nucleus Nano 2, have grips with dials that you can use to control the motors. So you can still have your focusing and zooming control, just not where you have to touch the lens. Now, if you're wondering about why all of this thing and why care, well, the answer is that handles work to help mitigate camera shake. The, we all shake or move around a little bit, and when you're holding the camera directly in your hands, that shake is directly transmitted through the camera and shows up as movement in our pictures. When you use grips, or in the most sort of significant case, a like big ring grip, what you're doing is moving your hands further away from the camera. Now, since the movement of our hands is gonna be largely the same, if you move the hands, your hands further from the camera, then that grip works like a lever and it divides how much your hand moved relative to what the camera is gonna move. Now, if you do a lot of handheld work, you will probably want to get something more than just a top grip and you will probably want to have grips. Even if you're doing stuff with a gimbal, if you think you're gonna take the camera off the gimbal and run and gun handheld, grips are what you want. Now this brings me to the last thing that I wanted to talk about in this video, which is power. Back when I got my R5C, I picked up an Anchor PowerCore 3 USB power delivery power brick. This was a 95 watt hour battery pack and that has enough capacity for the way I shoot at least that not only can it fast charge my MacBook Pro and my phone and everything else and power my camera, but given that most of the time I'm shooting at 24 frames per second, my camera, I'm only pulling, and I'm not using 8K or RAW, I only pull about 10 watts, and so a 95 watt hour battery will give me what amounts to about nine to nine and a half hours of continuous shooting which is basically more than I will ever do in a day. Now, when I rigged that up originally, my solution was to bungee the PowerCore 3 battery to a Camvate 1751 cheese plate, which in turn has a really right stuff FAQR1 flash quick release plate mounted to it, which I already had from back when I did photography. I didn't buy it, and quite now I wouldn't recommend buying it anyway. And then that all was stuck on a generic cold shoe mount adapter thing that I could put in the cold shoe side of my cage on my camera and battery is mounted and so on and so forth. And the whole point of the quick release plate was just to make this whole setup easier to take apart for either charging or travel. And I gotta be honest, for two years, I have used the PowerCore 3 and I will continue to use it going into the future, but it is not without its problems. The biggest of which is that it's big and heavy. Now, I mean, it's not a 500 F4 big and heavy, but it is bigger and heavier than it might want. you might want it to be. So for example, I can't really use it when my camera is on my gimbal as the positioning and everything kind of throws the balance off. And even sort of running and gunning handheld, there is a noticeable increase in weight from it. So I have been keeping my eye out for a solution that might work better. Now I had considered to switching to one of the many micro V-mount or gold mount batteries that are out there but I don't actually feel that the R5C's form factor works well with those. Basically everything I've, or every rig I've seen that uses them puts them behind the camera and that either blocks the screen from opening or closing and almost always blocks the EVF from being used, which means you kind of have to make some real limitations or whatever, uh, or real decisions, I should say, on how and why you're, what you're shooting and power and all of that. 
Now, maybe it's not the best place to put the battery on my camera, but for me, where I keep my battery sort of pointed out over the lens on the top left side just keeps it out of everything in the way of shooting and I can wrap the power cord around the stand and it keeps that tucked out of the way too. So this is where Small Rig's 3168B NPF battery mount adapter plate advanced edition comes in. So this takes an NPF style battery and outputs a 7.4 volt and 12 volt DC connection, as well as USB power delivery at up to 36 watts, which powers the R5C. So when paired with an approximately 55 watt hour Sony NPF uh, 900 series style battery, that'll give you about five hours of shooting in the low power modes and about three and a half hours of shooting if you're going to for 8K60 or something like that. With the smaller, lighter NPF 700 series batteries, which are actually what I'm using, you're looking at around three and a half hours for the low power options and two hours for the higher frame rate and resolution options, which is still better than 20 minutes to an hour. Now, additionally, the mounting plate is also a USB power delivery charger for your NPF batteries. So it pulls double duty when you're out on the road. First, you can use it to power your camera, and then at night, you can plug it into your USB power delivery supply and charge your batteries with it. Now, well, I've historically tried to stay away from NPF batteries because I didn't want more batteries in my life. They are absolutely pervasive for powering everything from lights to monitors to sliders to everything that's out there. And if you're anything like me, by no deliberate design or choice, there is a good chance that you have already accrued a bunch of them from lights and stuff, and so might as well just use them. Now, the other power-related thing I have changed is the USB-C cable. The cable I showed in my previous video was rated for 60 watts and had 5 gigabit data transfer, which is great. However, it was also fairly thick. And I swapped that out for a DJI 30 centimeter L-shaped multi-camera control cable, which is what they call it, but it's just a USB-C cable. Mine came with my RS3 Pro, so I didn't have to go search for it or whatever. And I would note that while I'm talking specifically about a DJI cable, you really don't need a DJI cable for this. What you want is a thin cable. At least that's what my experience has told me. So to make a long story short, what I have found is that thinner, more flexible cables make it easier to route the cable so that it can be kept out of the way from being snagged. And the biggest thing that you can do to damage the ports and stuff on your camera is have a cable get snagged, caught, and then yanked at a funny angle out of the port. Now, while the DJI cables connector doesn't fit as tightly in the Canon port protector as the previous cables did, uh, the reality is if you run into that problem, you can easily fix that with a couple of wraps of electrical tape around the plastic housing for the connector. So that is how my rig has evolved in the almost two years that I have been working with it. In some ways, honestly, it really hasn't changed that much. And some of those changes have certainly made things nicer, specifically the battery, which is actually a relatively recent one. So if you found this useful or at least interesting, let me know by hitting that like button or sharing this. If this kind of seem things, if this kind of thing seems like it might be your kind of thing, please consider subscribing if you aren't already. Finally, if you'd like to directly support this video and future content like this, please consider hitting that thanks button if you can, or buying something you've always wanted or one of the products that I talked about from an affiliate link in the description below. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.